All right, well, our passage this morning is uh, only three short verses, but they are verses packed with um, <laughs> some, oh, some, you know, heavy, heavy uh, duties and yet not heavy because as our Lord reminds us uh, through the Apostle John and 1 John, the, the commandments are really not a burden to those who, um, who love the commandments, you know, who, who love to do what's being commanded. It's not difficult to do what you want to do, is it? It's only difficult to do it if you don't want to do it. And if we don't want to do what the Lord calls us to do, we know that's the flesh, okay? We know that that's sin, and that's what we need to resist, okay? So anyway, this tells us of our duty to provide for the poor. Let me read the verses, and then we'll, we'll look at these. So Luke 14, beginning in verse 12. And he also went on to say to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner... Do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Boy, what more needs to be said? Well, let, let's take a, little, a look at this and let's be encouraged to think about what we might be able to do to help those in need. Now, again, last time uh, we, we saw a prominent Pharisee, one of the leaders of the Pharisees, invite Jesus over to his house to break bread on the Sabbath day. Now, he did it to find a reason to accuse Jesus, but Jesus went that he might use the opportunity to do him and those who had gathered with him on that occasion to do them some good. Now, Jesus had many lessons to teach, and the first subject he addressed was the Sabbath. Whether or not it was lawful to heal on a day that was meant to be a day of rest, not work, rest, and worship, the day that God gave us to spend with him. And again, remember, it, it is the day he's given to us, not just the hour or the hour and a half or the two hours, but he wants us to spend the day with him. Now, a man who was suffering from dropsy was present. And remember, dropsy is a term that refers to edema, severe water retention that apparently was crippling the man. Whether he came because he heard Jesus had been invited and wanted to be healed by Jesus or whether the Pharisees had arranged for him to be there in order to test Jesus, we don't know. But we do know that Jesus healed him to settle the question, okay? He wanted to show them and us that our love needs to be consistent. And it can only be consistent by keeping the commandments because they are the law of love, the law of liberty, the law of love. That's how we show love to God and our neighbor. We do need to love God by keeping the first four commandments. Yes, we do need to keep the Sabbath holy and not do unnecessary work on that day, but also by loving our neighbor, uh, by keeping the last six commandments. Remember the sixth commandment, do not murder, also means that you need to help your neighbor relieve his suffering if you can minister to him. And you do that even on the Lord's Day. So keeping the Lord's Day does not mean the other commandments are suspended. We, we do all the Lord calls us to do. We love him and our neighbor even on the Lord's Day. Now the Pharisees might help their children. They might even help an animal they cared about. But they wouldn't help this man. Jesus said, you need to care for this man as well. Now, his second lesson was on humility. Remember, as Jesus was watching the guests, he saw them scrambling for the seats of honor. You know, those are the box seats, the ones that get taken first, you know, the, the, the places that people would want. And he pointed out to them how embarrassing it would be for them if someone more important than they had been invited and they had to give way and go to the lowest seat. But how honoring it would be for them if they took the lowest seat to begin with and then were asked to move up higher. Jesus was telling them. Jesus is telling us. He was, as he would later tell his disciples, that the way to greatness in God's kingdom is not by exalting yourself, but by humbling yourself to become the servant of all, even as Jesus, being God, uh, humbled himself and took on our nature in order that he might serve us by going to the cross and laying down his life for us. 
But Jesus, as I mentioned already, has two more lessons that he wants to teach them before he leaves this particular uh, luncheon, this particular dinner party. Now, the first one is on giving, you know, who should be the objects of our charity. And the second, on the blessing of entering into God's kingdom. Now, this morning, we're going to look at two things that he teaches about giving. First of all, that we should help the poor, that, that we should extend charity to them. And secondly, that if we do this, God will repay us. Now, first he says we should, we should help the poor. Jesus, you know, he's been addressing various issues, you know, all the Pharisees regarding the Sabbath, and then those that were scrambling for the seats of honor, you know, which included those that were coming to the table, which I imagine would be most of the guests, or if not all of them. But here he goes on to advise the host of the guest. Everything he says here is directed towards that man because he was the one responsible for putting this whole thing together. He tells him how to arrange his guest list the next time he plans a banquet. Now, the first thing he tells him is who it is that should not be on that list. We read in verse 12. And he also went on to say to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. Now, remember how Jesus had just pointed out their favoritism when it came to, to uh, who it was they would help on the Sabbath and who they wouldn't? Well, the same favoritism dominated this banquet. The host invited only those people that he cared about or perhaps hoped to gain something from. Those who were members of his religious sect, his family members, and those who might somewhere down the road be of benefit to him. Now, his friends would have been those Pharisees because they pretty much stuck together, right? With whom he was particularly close, right? Those were his friends among the Pharisees. His brothers would be, you know, his kinsmen, his countrymen. But as we know, Pharisees kept pretty much to themselves. So it would probably be other Pharisees that, that aren't as close as his friends. And the lawyers and the scribes who were very much like them. His relatives are family members. I mean, yes, the Pharisees, they love their family members as well. And then, of course, there were the rich neighbors. He cared about them because, not because they were friends or brothers or relatives, but because they were rich, okay? He hoped, you know, to gain something that he might, you know, by inviting them over. Now, Jesus told the man, next time you plan a social event, do not invite these. Now, that, that seems a little bit harsh, doesn't it? Because, I mean, is it necessarily wrong to invite friends over or to invite, you know, others, you know, like uh, relatives and uh, maybe some of your neighbors? Well, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily. And actually, Jesus is not telling him not to invite them. This is one of those areas where the translation doesn't really do justice to what's actually being said in the text. Jesus did not say that he should never invite his friends and neighbors over for dinner. But what he was saying is this, don't do it all the time. Okay, don't do it continually. Literally, he says, do not keep on inviting these this is a habit that you need to break. And I think what he meant by that too was exclusively just these people. But if he didn't invite these people, then, you know, whom should he invite? Well, the people, of course, he doesn't want to invite. That's the reason why he didn't invite them. But the people that he should, Jesus says in verse 13. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Invite those, he says, who have little or nothing. Invite those with disabling conditions. Invite those who can't walk. Invite those who can't see. In other words, invite those who are completely dependent upon you and others for the things that they need each day just to survive because they are the ones who need it the most. You know, that is really what our Lord is, is calling us to do as well, isn't it? We've already read in, in James, okay? And James is addressing this to, to Christians, to members of the New Covenant, to us as well. In verse, or excuse me, in chapter 1, verse 27, James said this, Pure 
and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Okay, now orphans, um, these are not orphans that are necessarily in orphanages. This is probably something closer to what George Mueller saw when he was looking at all the street urchins and the orphans, they were just on the street with nobody to take care of them. They were without parents and without means of support. They didn't have food, they didn't have clothing, they didn't have shelter. Widows are women without husbands. And in those days, you know, the jobs for women were relatively few, if, if not non-existent, and they needed their husbands to provide for them, to provide a house, to provide food, and, and all the things that they need. These have no means of support. And what James is telling us is that we need to be concerned. What is pure and undefiled religion? To be concerned about them, right? To be concerned enough actually to go to them and to help them. Solomon writes in Proverbs 14, verse 31, he who oppresses the poor taunts his maker, but he who is gracious to the needy honors him. So Jesus is telling us that we need to have a care and a concern for those who are destitute, those who are poor, those who cannot support themselves. Now, is Jesus telling us that the next time we plan a dinner, and by the way, when is the next time we're planning a banquet? Thanksgiving is coming up, right? Okay, is he telling us that at our Thanksgiving dinners that we should be inviting the poor? We should be looking for those to invite. Should we be going out on the streets and inviting the, the transients that we see to come into our homes and to share a meal with us. Now, here's where we need to see that there is a bit of a distinction between that culture and our present culture. You know, not this, this isn't like a complete difference, but it's a pretty big one. Uh, we need to realize that, that our situation is a bit different than that of the Pharisees. In their day, it was really quite easy to tell who it was that was really in need. That's not quite so easy to do today. Because those who were in need every day sat or stood on the street corners crying out and begging for alms, begging for somebody to show them some mercy so that they could have what they needed just for one more day. Now remember, these towns were small and everybody knew each other. Uh, they knew who was genuine and they knew who wasn't genuine because they saw them each and every day, right? Now, can we say the same today? I'd say things are not quite as clear today. There are still lots of people who might hold out their hands to you in a parking lot or on the street corner, you know, will work for money and have the basket and so forth. You know, most of those people are doing that because they make more money doing that than they do working a job. It's not that they can't work. It's just that it's easier to make money that way. But they're not the same kind of person. I mean, what do we know about these people who are asking for alms for us. How many of them are in that situation because of crime? You know, because they've injured other people, they've gone to prison, and maybe now they're out and it's, it's cost them. Well, even people sometimes in that situation, we need to help if they're looking to recover from that. Or maybe they got there because of drugs. Maybe they're asking for money because they want drugs or they want to buy alcohol. Or how many are there simply because they just don't want to work? You know, it's interesting, when, uh, <clears throat> when Don and I were in Germany, one thing we saw on the streets, almost in every of the major cities we went to, were, were folks, and I think many of them were probably, they looked, they looked to me, I may be mistaken, but they looked Middle Eastern. Uh, they were men and women that were sitting, some of them were, were crippled, I think. Uh, not all of them, I think I saw one that was crippled, and yet he was getting around pretty well. He could walk for blocks with, um, I think, missing perhaps a leg or something. And there were some older folks, older men and women, and every one of them would hold their empty cup up to you as you went by asking for alms. Uh, when we finally decided that we would, you know, we, we just couldn't, you know, feel comfortable not helping them anymore, we, we found one that was an elderly woman, and she was reaching out with her cup and, and speaking in language we didn't understand, and we understood she wanted money. So we threw some euros into her cup, and as soon as she got the euros, she, she just poured them into her hand and started counting them, put them in her pocket, and held her empty cup out again. She never thanked us and never looked at us. And it made us think that maybe, maybe she wasn't quite as sincere as um, we, we thought that, that she was. We do need to be careful, as I've said, 
Uh, I think we saw other groups of them gathering together later and sort of putting their money together to see how much they had, had gathered. Um, <clears throat> we are to help people who can't help themselves, but we're not to help people who could be working and who choose not to work. Remember what Paul said or what he wrote to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 10. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. Now, why did, why did Paul say that? Well, it's because he knew that the cure for laziness was hunger. And as long as we're feeding somebody and, and taking away their hunger, they have no motivation to work. We're just enabling them to continue to be lazy. Now, there may be those who are on the streets who should be the objects of our mercy. I'm not saying there aren't any such, but it's just very hard to tell in our culture. I have to admit that most of the people who have come to the church over the years, I'm not talking about people within the church, but people who have just come from outside the church looking for diaconal help, I, I'm not sure that I've ever actually helped anyone who was a legitimate need. And many people I turned away just because you could tell from their stories and the inconsistencies and the inability to check up on them that they were just completely false. They were just coming to the church looking for easy money. And as a matter of fact, a couple decades ago, even a couple decades ago, I discovered from some of the people who came that the churches had basically closed their doors to these people because they were notorious for, for, for lying and trying to steal money from the church. So it's hard to tell when somebody really is in need. And then we also need to consider that in our society we have something that the Jewish culture didn't have. Uh, we live in what's called a welfare state, right, where there's government programs that have been put in place to help those who can't help themselves. Now, we may or may not agree with these programs, but we, we certainly understand that they do exist. And people take advantage of these programs, and so their, their needs are being met. So they're not necessarily as destitute as we, we might think they are. People may not be exactly what they seem to be. So now the question arises, if we can't find any people around us who are poor and who should be the objects of our charity, does that mean that we're off the hook and, and that we don't have to give to the poor? Well, not really, because there's many people in the world who need our help. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 26, 11. He says, for you always have the poor with you, okay? There's always going to be poverty around us. If we can't find somebody in our neighborhood, if we can't find somebody in our state or country, there are many others that are out there, right? And there are efforts that are being made to, to help them, you know, such as through Westminster Biblical Missions. They're trying to provide medical care and food and trying to help the nominal Christians that have been shoved outside of the Muslim society. There's come over and help who are helping those who are destitute and poor in the Ukraine area, you know, founding orphanages. And for a while there, they were trying to put these children into Christian families and provide the money for those families to raise those children so that they would be raised knowing the Lord Jesus. And they also, of course, raise up ministers. There's what's called Samaritan's Purse that tries to get out there and help those that have been devastated. And of course, our own denominational diaconal committee which is, you know, seeking to be a first responder to, you know, places in our country, at least, and I think even outside our country, that are devastated by hurricanes and, and things of that nature. Now, there's plenty of needs, and we're never going to be able to relieve all the poverty. Jesus certainly recognized that when he says, you always have the poor with you. But that means we're always going to have the opportunity to give, Right? Jesus continued in that same passage in Mark 14, verse 7. He says, whenever you wish, you can do good to them. Jesus wants us to consider this morning whether, whether we're doing, you know, what we should be doing as far as caring for the poor. But now that brings us to the second point. The second point has to do with motivation, right? Why should we do this? Why should we give to the poor? Well, we should certainly do it because our Lord commands us to do it, but there's, there's another motivation that's included here, and he tells us about it in verse 14. He actually says in verses 13 and 14, but when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you. 
For you will be repaid. Notice, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Notice, you notice that, um, you know, where they're going to be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous, does that tell you something about the character of the righteous, right? Is that they're those who help the poor. But our Lord is telling us here is this, if we help them, God will repay us. Now, the problem with inviting our friends and our brothers, our relatives and our rich neighbors, if we happen to have any rich neighbors, is that they will likely invite us in return. And Jesus said in verse 12, that will be your repayment. Again, I remember in the past being in these health and wealth churches, which I, I don't recommend. Um, somebody would come and begin asking for people to donate to his ministry. Don't grieve and quench the Holy Spirit. Raise your hand if you're going to give $1,000 to my ministry. People would raise their hands. Now give, her, give them a pl- you know, give them a hand. Everybody would applaud them. And I remember even then as, as being you know, my mid-teens, that person just got their reward in full. <laughs> that's, they just got the applause of men. If that's, that's all they're going to get that be, because the Lord tells us to do this in secret. But if we invite somebody and they invite us in return, that is all we can expect to receive. As Jesus said on other occasions, when you do things to be seen of people, when you do things for other people expecting to receive back, that is all you can expect to get. But if you do it in secret so that only God sees, or in this case, if we give to those who can't repay us, God says he's going to take the, the, the ownership of that debt upon himself, and he's going to be the one who's going to repay us. We read in our meditation, or essentially we read in our meditation, one who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his good deed. The Lord is the one who will repay. Now, th- this is bringing up a subject that we've seen in the past, but I think we should review again. And that is that the things that we spend on ourselves in this life, the things that we hold on to in this world, are the things that one day we're going to have to leave behind for somebody else, right? Remember what Jesus said to the rich young ruler when he came to him? Sell all that you have, give it to the poor, you'll have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. You want to <clears throat> transfer those riches to heaven? Give them, give them away to the poor. Well, that's Again, a principle. The Lord's not telling us we need to give everything away, but he is telling us through that and through this that whatever we do give away, we actually do get to keep forever. We hold on to, stays here. What we give, we get to hold on to in heaven forever. Now, there's many ways to invest in God's kingdom. Remember, we can support his work through our prayers. When we give our time and we pray and seek the Lord, we're investing in the kingdom of heaven. When we give of our, of our uh, resources, of our tithes and offerings, we are investing in something that we will receive again in heaven. When we use our gifts and our energies to serve others, then we are storing up treasures in heaven. When we evangelize, okay, then we are doing the same thing. As a matter of fact, the Lord talks about increased glory for those who lead the many to righteousness. So all the time and energy and money that we invest here, we can expect to receive back from him at the resurrection and the final judgment. And what he will give to us there is going to be a lot better than what we give up here, right? Not only because we get to keep it forever, but it's because of the quality of what it is he is going to give us in terms of reward. Now, Jesus tells us here this morning that there's one more way that we can invest in, in the kingdom and store up treasures in heaven, and that is by giving to the poor. Now, Jesus does not tell us how much we should give. He doesn't tell us how often we should give. He said in Mark 14, verse 7, whenever you wish, you can do good to them. So there is a commandment to, to provide for them, but it's not a specific commandment. It's something we should do but he doesn't tell us how much and how often. Now, again, why should we do this? Well, not only is this one of the ways that the Lord has planned to provide for the poor. Remember the the Lord's heart for the poor? Remember Jesus' heart for the poor. But even in the Old Testament, when God gave the commandments regarding harvest, how he said, don't don't glean or, you know, well, don't, don't harvest to the edges of your field, but leave the edges of your field 
the ones that are most easily accessible for the poor so they can go in there and glean and they can eat and they can rejoice and praise God. Okay, so the Lord was concerned about the poor there as well. He's still concerned about the poor. And this, our giving to the poor, is one of the ways that he provides for them. It's not the only way, but it is one of the ways that he provides for them. But let me just close with this. It's another way that he blesses us, okay? Not only by storing up treasures in heaven, which we're going to receive from him on that day, but also by transferring our affections to heaven, okay? Because as our Lord tells us, the more, we, the more we let go of in this world and give up to him and transfer to heaven, the less our hearts are going to be set on this world and the more they're going to be set on the world which is coming, which means by our giving to the poor and, and transferring those riches to heaven, we're actually transferring our heart to heaven along with it. And that's what Jesus meant when he said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So the more we give, the greater our treasure is going to be in heaven. And the greater our treasure in heaven, the more we're going to want to be there in heaven. So the more we invest in the kingdom of heaven, the more we're going to love heaven and want to be there. So may the Lord, again, give to us the grace of giving, the grace of investing, the grace of prayer, the grace of service, the grace of evangelism, um, and, of course, giving to the poor so that our desire to be with him in glory will be strengthened. Where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us take all this in and to be able to, to do what he has called us to do if we're not already doing it.